Good morning. My name is Daniela Valleganoi. I'm associate, he uh, associate professor and head of the philosophy department. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all. So welcome, graduating class of 2018. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome friends, family, relatives, all of you welcome. Graduation marks an important threshold, the end of a time devoted to studying, to intellectual and personal growth, a time that should prepare one for whatever comes next. Whatever comes next, not only professionally, but also in life more generally. Whatever comes next will be different for all of you, whether those of you receiving a bachelor degree or an MA degree will continue studying or plan to get a job or to travel and live for a while abroad in another country or whatever else you think you might do next. As for those receiving a PhD, most of you will go on to a teaching position at another university and you will begin your professional career as academics. My best wishes to all of you. Having concrete plans does not abolish the uncertainty that comes as one stays at the threshold. None of us quite knows what comes next. I hope that your studies in philosophy helped you grow in a way that allows you to embrace this uncertainty and to live wisely with the unforeseeable challenges the future brings. My, all, my father always had a saying, and since he was German, it's in German, I'm gonna say it first in German. Erstens kommt's, zweitens anders, drittens als man denkt. In English, it's gonna happen. Second, differently, and third, differently than you think. But consider how boring life would be if this were not the case. So, I hope you can stand at this threshold, not only embracing uncertainty, but also with exhilaration and curiosity. To the parents in the room who made sacrifices and offered support to their child, and especially to those who have been quite worried that their child has studied a notoriously breadless subject, <laughs> I want to offer some perhaps relieving facts. <laughs> Statistics say that philosophy majors end up earning higher salaries than majors in business, accounting, and political science. Hmm? You can look this up at payscale.com. In fact, we are second only to economics. A major in philosophy opens many doors to many kinds of jobs, not just becoming a teacher, but also, for example, to being a successful manager or lawyer. This is because a philosophy major teaches you a variety of basic skills, from logical and critical thinking, to reflecting on and understanding ethical and social life and relations, and communicating effectively with people from all kinds of backgrounds. Our philosophy program distinguishes itself with a faculty coming from a variety of different traditions and backgrounds, and you will hear more about that shortly. And it distinguishes itself for its pluralist approach to philosophy, which means that our majors learn to think of and to understand issues from a variety of different perspectives. They learn to think outside the box and to seek and find novel or different possibilities of thinking, relating, and acting. Before leaving the podium so that Professor Naomi Zak may tell you a little bit more about our faculty, I would like to invite all of you who are graduating to feel free to say a few words when you come up here on the stage to get your diplomas. That you can be here today has much to do with your own determination, hard work and hard work, but it has also much to do with the support of family and friends, teachers who are here today,
proud of your accomplishments and ready to celebrate you. I know that all of you were invited to fill out a questionnaire, but perhaps in addition to that, when you come up here, you know, feel free. Maybe there's somebody you want to thank, something you want to, to say. This is, this is the moment for you. Again, welcome to all of you and congratulations to the class of 2018. <laughs> It is uh, my honor to introduce the faculty to you, but it's a little bit more complicated than you might think because there are three different ways in which the faculty get categorized um, and, and, and uh, compete over who gets named first, but very subtly. So on the website, it's alphabetical. Uh, in, in, in the procession that you just saw, it's based on academic rank. And in your program, and in the order in which I'm going to introduce the faculty, it's based on administrative rank within the department. So, so you can follow along in your program if you want, if you have a program. <laughs> and there's one other thing. Um, not all of the faculty are here. Uh, the ones who are not here are, they're still alive, but they're just, <laughs> they're just, in some other place geographically, you know, on, <laughs> on the planet. Okay, so, well, we, we get around, you know, we travel. Um, so let me begin uh, with uh, Professor Daniela Valle Anu, who just spoke to you, and uh, she is uh, head of philosophy and associate uh, professor of philosophy and we found out just this morning by email that Daniela has received the fund for Faculty Excellence Award in recognition of the significant impact of her scholarly work and her commitment to the university. So thank you, so thank you for being our department head. She's the only one whose award I'm going to mention because she is department head. Um, so uh, Danielle's interests are 19th and 20th century European thought, especially Nietzsche, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, contempor and contemporary French thought, phenomenology, hermeneutics, deconstruction, and ontology related to issues of the body. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Peter Warnick, who is, oh, oh, those who are here, please wave or stand up or something. Um, <laughs> Peter Warnick is Associate Head of Philosophy and Associate Professor of Philosophy, and his interests are ancient philosophy, 19th, 20th century continental philosophy, Kant, philosophy of nature, myth, tragedy, and history of philosophy. Next is Bonnie Mann, and she is not present. Uh, Bonnie Mann is professor of philosophy and has been director of graduate studies this term. Her interests are feminist philosophy and continental philosophy. Erin McKenna, professor of philosophy, <laughs> director, of, of uh, director of undergraduate studies, and her interests are feminist theory and American pragmatism. Colin Koopman, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Ethics Minor Director during the spring, uh, this spring term. Also, uh, Colin is Director of New Media and, Cultures and the Culture Certificate Program. His interests are political philosophy, ethics, pragmatism, genealogy, and the history of modernity. I thought he would be here today, but I don't think he is. Okay, unfortunately not. Um, I'm listed next, I'm professor of philosophy. My interests are philosophy of race, philosophy of science and political philosophy, feminist theory, justice and injustice theory, disaster ethics, history of philosophy, especially um, early modern 17th century philosophy. Mark Johnson. Mark is uh, Philip H. Knight, professor of liberal arts and sciences. His interests are metaphor theory, 
philosophy of language, philosophy and cognitive science, American philosophy, Kant, moral philosophy, ethical naturalism, and aesthetics. Scott Pratt, Scott Pratt is not present. He is executive vice provost for academic affairs and professor of philosophy. His interests are American philosophy, history of philosophy, and logic. Beata Stwarska, Beata is professor of philosophy. Her interests are contemporary European philosophy, phenomenology, structuralism, and post-structuralism, philosophical psychology, and feminism, and she's not here. Alejandro Arturo Vallea Arandondo, is that? This, okay. Um, <laughs> no, I, I was previously only used to three names, and now there are four, so, okay, great. Um, <laughs> Alejandro is associate professor of philosophy. His interests are Latin American thought, philosophy of liberation, decolonial thought, hermeneutics and deconstruction, and aesthetics. Rocio Zambrana, also not here. She is associate professor of philosophy. Her interests are continental philosophy, especially Kant and German idealism, particularly Hegel, Marx, and the Frankfurt School critical theory and decolonial thought and decolonial feminism. Nikolai Morar, Nikolai Morar is not here, he's in Paris. Um, he's assistant professor of philosophy and environmental studies, and his interests are applied ethics, philosophy of biology, and 20th century continental philosophy. Kamisha Russell, Kamisha is assistant professor of philosophy. Her interests are critical philosophy of race, ethics, especially bioethics, African-American philosophy, and feminist theory. Stephen Brents. Stephen Brents is senior instructor of philosophy, and his interests are social political philosophy, ethics, philosophy of film, pragmatism, 19th and 20th century German philosophy. Paul Baudin. <laughs> Paul is adjunct instructor of philosophy. His interests are education studies, elementary and middle school writing and social studies, philosophy for children curricula and community outreach, and also jazz performance and composition and hiking the Sierras and North Cascades. <laughs> Caroline Lundquist, uh, Caroline is pro tem instructor and she is affiliated with the philosophy department. I might also add that she is a, a relatively recent graduate of our philosophy department. <laughs> David Means uh, is not present. He is a pro tem instructor and he's uh, affiliated with education as well as the philosophy department. And Rebecca Saxon, also not present, is a pro tem instructor uh, uh, in an administrative capacity. As well, today we are honored to be joined by Malcolm Wilson, who is professor of classics and department head of classics, uh, and also affiliated with the philosophy department. Malcolm's interests are the history of science and the philosophical issues surrounding the organization of systematic knowledge in antiquity, Greek philosophy, Aristotle, and Greek intellectual history. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> first of all, of course, congratulations to those graduating. Um, against philosophy. <clears throat> the most expensive soccer player in the world costs 1,170 million euros. The president of one of the most powerful and aggressive nations in the world <clears throat> sits on the toilet and tweets to millions who hold their breath in expectation, even when the messages may very well be nothing more than alternative facts. Bill Gates, Bill Gates' uh, photogra uh, photograph collection includes 17 million images 
and is now buried 220 feet underground in a sub-zero low humidity storage vault. The images include pictures of the Wright brothers, the pictures of JFK Jr. saluting his father's coffin, and many important historical images such as from the Vietnam War and Nelson Mandela's years in prison. The images are totally inaccessible and they are being digi di uh, digitalized. It is estimated that it will take 453 years to digitalize them all. Gates' state also holds the rights to other 65 million images, including the rights to images in many of the world's principal museums. These few facts <clears throat> call forth a series of apparent ways of being in our society. With the leader of the free world appears the capitalist division of labor and class, that is, with the disappearance of the middle class and a more and more evident divide between the 1% and the rest. Moreover, this, in a male-dominated world, ordered by gender roles and sexualized bodies, where violence against women and against all differences is clearly um, <clears throat> present for us every day. To this one may add, in all three cases above, racism, with the perpetuation of white Western cultural um, uh, prejudices over all others. A focus on the accumulation of wealth as the end goal of any life and the commodification of all dimensions of living, including the senses and the imagination, as you just heard about Bill Gates. These are difficult times when one thinks about it. And how many, and how may one think about this? When's the language to do so? considering that one finds oneself in a situation in which alternative facts seem to take a prominent place in this society's self-understanding, and also when the affective memories of whole communities are disappeared, buried, as they get buried in a mountain and become a question of rights. Alternative facts make things difficult indeed, since they dismiss the facts of history. Indeed, if one is creative with alternative facts, at least for a short time, in the immediate now, in the heat of the moment, history no longer matters. And this displacement of history does fit the other characteristics of these times in this America. Again, the ideals and mercantilist rationalism behind wealth accumulation the growth of technology and applications of knowledge for the sake of further accumulation, a growth that cares not for history, but for future infinite progress and its new arriving order. The imagination takes its place at the head of progress as the maiden of all sciences and utilitarian problem solving. What is needed are solutions, not memories, solutions, not images, not imaginaries that deviate from the project of the progress of humanity. Out of the vault, we will trot out what we need for progress. And to speak of humanity, one would say from gazing at the front page of the New York Times, is to speak of exclusion, racism, sexual discrimination, nationalism, extremists, of building walls, isolation, borders with the strictest control, keeping the violence we inflict at a safe distance from us. If one stops to think, desperation may set in. The need to do something, the need to act for change, the need to fix the problem, find solutions. And yet, how often are such actions done for the sake of bringing all into this same system of violence and force, and in the name of a freedom that will allow alternative facts that may, be include, uh, that may include other gazes into its one and only pluralist world? Alternative facts certainly disturb history and accuracy in the moment, and yet, like it or not, we humans in our distinct ways are for the most part memorial beings. 
We carry our histories, lineages, and memories with us, not only in a rational, analytical way, but in our effects and bodies. We are memorial beings. And this means that without regard for our engagement or indifference to history, memories, we are claimed by them. This is a simple hermeneutical point. We may engage our memorial dimensions and think with them in a way that takes tradition in its active sense, that is, as the dynamic place of encounters and transformations. Or we may close our eyes to those histories and lineages we carry. And while believing we are changing the world, we may very well, very likely be claimed by an invisible, sovereign, unchanging blanket of power relations that puts us right where we no longer wanted to be. Even in our best intentions and purest visions, we share the danger of reaffirming what we seek to change. But there is an alternative way that disrupts history in a transformative way, a liberating way. History in its dialectical progress may be interrupted at any moment by what has been discarded, excluded, and considered of little value, if not nothing, in the heat of the moment, in the narratives of progress. This is an anachronic moment. The excluded idea, a letter, an involuntary memory appears to disrupt the comfort of progress and takes us back to a time of conception, of birthing, in which the concreteness of experience leaves no room for alternative facts. This is not a religious experience, the result of reason alone, or the result of the application of power and wealth. The rush that transforms one's life may come at any moment from a simple gesture, a leaf, a stone, a change in the weather, as the Japanese philosopher Watsuji would put it, a turn of phrase or verse, a discarded idea. This is why Walter Benjamin, when unpacking his library, felt that his most important books were the unread ones, the ones that were coming. In this sense, power, wealth, control stand behind and can never catch up to wonder to the encounters with what does not belong to us, that which one cannot measure, define, manipulate, and dominate or produce. As you go forth into that difficult world we inhabit, challenged by the poverty of language, submerged in a cacophony of meaningless words, jingles, promises, and images present and sequestered, as you enter that wild clamor, uh, uh, as you enter that white clamor and desert, I hope that like Walter Benjamin and myself and many of us philosophers, sometimes you will manage to be anachronic, oblivious, crafting the most difficult art of being in the world, in community as most critical flaneurs, that is, as contemporaries. Congratulations and thank you. Good morning. Uh, each year, the Philosophy Department awards the Philosophy, Matter Pri Ma Ph Philosophy Matters Prize for the best UO undergraduate and graduate student essays that showcase the continued relevance of philosophy to concrete, concrete issues facing the world. Uh, it is my honor to award the prize for best undergraduate paper. Our finalists were Vanessa Jackson, Megan Lyslo, Nisha Sridhar, and Guthrie Stafford. And our winner is Megan Lyslo. <laughs> Megan's essay, Curdling Logic and Scientific Inquiry, offers a way to bring crucial feminist insights to scientific inquiry while avoiding, in her own words, the politically regressive danger of falling into a full discrediting of science. 
Rather than abandon any notion of unbiased objectivity, she seeks to transform that notion through, again in her words, quote, a creative and collaborative project, which as a matter of course would seek to synergistically integrate the curdled perspectives experience, and experiences of multiplicitous beings so as to create a clearer and more unbiased scientific process, end quote. Her, descript her descriptions of the theories upon which she draws are strong and clear, as are her contributions to the discussion. Her insight and creativity are a model for the engaged philosophy this program prizes. Congratulations, Megan. Uh, it is my pleasure to um, um, give the prize for the Philosophy Matter uh, uh, essay for the uh, graduate essay. Um, the winner uh, is Joshua Kerr. He's a fourth year PhD student. A student, uh, student. He is an he is ABD or by dissertation so that he has finished all of his work. Now he writes, his interests are philosophy of nature, especially vegetality philosophy of literature, 19th and 20th century continental philosophy. In his website for research, he writes, my research focuses on two primary areas. First, I study environmental philosophy, particularly the philosophy of plants, drawing both on broadly interdisciplinary approaches to plant life and the role of plants in the history of philosophy. I am interested in the challenges plants pose through traditional approaches to ontology and ethics. The second interest, he writes, uh, he says, second, I study the philosophy of literature, particularly poetry. I am interested in the relationship between literature, language, and non-linguistic expression, especially as it emerges in 20th century continental philosophers such as Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and Gilles Deleuze. In this respect, I also, lit uh, um, I also study uh, literary writers such as Wallace Stevens and Italo Calvino. Of his essay, uh, this is what he says about his essay. Um, Espinosa has very little to say concerning the creative arts. A careful consideration of those passages in which he discusses art, however, reveals art to have an importance for him that far outstrips what his relative silence might suggest. This paper argues that Spinoza commends art for its role in the genesis of rational philosophical knowledge. In the ethics, Spinoza offers a developmental account of this kind of knowledge. Specifically, he shows how reason develops out of the imagination or sense experience. By tracing his account of this process, we can begin to see the role that art plays in the education of the imagination that leads to philosophical knowledge. So please join uh, me in um, um, congratulating Joshua Kerr for his essay, Spinoza, From Art to Philosophy. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, among the, uh, uh, what, uh, our, our graduate, uh, um, let me start again. Our, uh, <laughs> th those were so lengthy. I didn't prepare something quite as some, I need to come up with something uh, uh, justifying or, you know, worthy of the award. Uh, I get to present the, the Paideia Prize, which is described on our website as, uh, uh, for the GTF, that's out of date, it's now GE graduate employee. Uh, who most exemplifies the ideals of undergraduate teaching. Uh, the winner of this year's prize uh, is genuinely deserving. I, I've gotten to work with her a, a couple of times in my philosophy of film class and my environmental philosophy class, and both instances at least half a dozen times a term, and this doesn't occur that often necessarily. Uh, uh, undergraduate students would tell me how, how much they uh, delighted in her teaching, 
uh, and how much they learned from her specifically. And I can confess it's one of the, the genuine delights of my job to get to work with each term uh, several of our uh, really, really talented uh, graduate students. Not only really uh, talented uh, uh, philosophers, uh, but exceptional teachers. And uh, this year's award winner is someone from whom I, I've learned uh, uh, in ways about teaching. Um, let, so let me cut this short and introduce Martina Ferrari, who's uh, our this year's winner. A very good undergraduates can testify. I'm, I'm not Colin Koopman. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Koopman, unfortunately, was unable to make it, so I'm filling in, in for him, and I will be uh, presenting the doctoral and, and master's candidates. Um, today is a day for celebration, an occasion uh, to come together and to extol and to honor the accomplishments of everyone in this room. Uh, not only the students who worked so hard um, to make it here, but also those who supported them, their families, friends, and loved ones, uh, faculty and, and the staff, and, and even, I'll dare to say it, the administrators. Um, and today is, is also an opportunity for us as faculty to express our admiration for you and to congratulate you on what you've achieved here at the University of Oregon. Um, and in this section especially, I think that's appropriate with regard to um, those who will be uh, completing their PhDs and, and master degrees. Let, let me say personally that I have found it to be a tremendous privilege to have been able to work with you. One of the things, among others, that philosophers do, even to the point of annoyance, is that we pay attention to words. To graduate means originally to take a step. And this, this step is symbolically enacted as each of you, as a degree candidate, walks across the stage. Yet every step is a transitional moment which marks not only a stepping away from something, but also a stepping towards something, a movement or a passage in which something is left behind in order to open up and make something possible. And so we call today a commencement. Commencement as a celebration is a coming together. It is a gathering of a community. But in commencing, we come together also in order to begin, to begin something new together by coming together. And even as each of you will, must now make that beginning by following your own way, facing what must remain an uncertain future, it will always be a beginning rooted in the time we shared here together. So it is now my great honor to present the doctoral and master's candidates. And I will begin with the doctoral candidates and then follow with master's candidates. Each of these individuals has completed as PhD candidates not only all the coursework and other requirements for this degree, but has also completed and defended a dissertation on a, on a philosophical topic and is thereby recognized for making a unique contribution to the discipline. So our first doctoral candidate, um, I don't believe he's here, uh, Russell Duvernoy. Uh, Dr. Duvernoy is now a full-time lecturer uh, in philosophy at Seattle University. Um, he defended his PhD in the fall of 2017 the title of which is From Individuality 
to ecological attunement in Whitehead and Deleuze. Um, next, Amy Marvin. <laughs> Amy will be defending her PhD in the fall Fall of 2018, her dissertation title is Humor Work, Feminist Philosophy, and Unstable Politics. And unfortunately, Amy's um, committee is not uh, present today, but her advisor, uh, Dr. Bonnie Mann, um, sent uh, to me the following remarks, which I will uh, read to you. So here is uh, Bonnie Mann's comments. Amy decided to write her dissertation on humor, and I was so relieved. <laughs> After chairing committees for folks who write about war and violence and trauma and various modes of social injustice, I thought, this is going to be the fun one. <laughs> a dissertation in the field of humor studies offering a feminist intervention. The implicit assumption in offering such an intervention is, of course, that feminists have a sense of humor and can actually be funny, which I was very relieved to discover since it goes against the grain of what everyone thinks about feminists and our work. It had taken me a while to realize that Amy was funny. Let, let me interject here. This isn't Bonnie Man, but I agree. <laughs> she would say these odd things in class. Everyone would sort of look at her and move on. <laughs> then a minute and a half later, I'd realize that the odd thing she'd said was both utterly brilliant and hilarious. And I'd end up laughing at a totally inappropriate moment in the middle of another student's very serious comment. So I've spent the last seven years trying to catch up. Looking forward to a lighthearted discussion, it took me a while to realize that Amy was actually building a heavy hitting, deadly serious, sharp as a knife criticism of the entire field of humor studies, which entertains unsustainable notions about itself about its innocence in relation to politics and power. Amy's dissertation is not just an occasion to laugh, though there are some very funny moments in it. It is about how social justice and injustice are at play in what she calls humor work, about humor used for purposes of humiliation and domination, about humor as a mode of justification for egregious beliefs and unconscionable circumstances. Humor set loose in the world to do one job and ending up doing something else entirely. And about humor work as an ambiguous, imperfect, but powerful site of resistance for those who are marginalized. This reflects Amy's own aspirations and accomplishments beyond the work toward her degree here at the University of Oregon, as she has become somewhat of a national celebrity, at least in certain virtual spaces as a sometimes funny, always formidable advocate for those who are among the most marginalized in the discipline of philosophy and in wider, wider society. In her teaching and in her work as a public intellectual, she has contributed to making philosophy and the broader world a more welcoming place. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, next, uh, Dana Lauren Wrongly. <laughs> and 
Malcolm Wilson uh, from the Classics Department is here today. He's on our committee and will present Dana for the degree. So come on up. Buddy. Thank you. Um, Dana, Dana's primary advisor was also Bonnie Mann, who, again, is not able to be here. She is present at her own daughter's uh, graduation today, which I think is a, it is the, it is our sad fate that we cannot be in two places at once. So there it is. So um, Bonnie has prepared the following remarks in the same manner, and I shall read them. Uh, Dana's dissertation, The Love of Nike on the Denials of Racialized Patriarchy and the Philosophy of Courageous Overcoming, tackles the problem of sexualized violence on college campuses. She offers a complex form of interdisciplinary cultural critique, arguing that we live in a trauma culture. This was not the funny dissertation. Okay. Um, a trauma culture which normalizes and institutionalizes certain responses to trauma that prevent us from facing up to physical and emotional violence and doom us to repeat it. Now, I'd like to interject at this point that I didn't get the doom us to repeat it part of the dissertation. Uh, I thought it was much more hopeful uh, than that. Uh, she identifies, Dana identifies patterns of denial as key to keeping the uh, trauma culture in place. Survivors of sexual violence are encouraged to get over it and to focus on the future. Uh, and institutional actors refuse the process of memory and memorization that are key to overcoming trauma. Since she is concerned with academic culture, Dana herself performs a radical act of memory, taking us back to the original academy and the works of Plato who formed that academy to find resources for courageously facing and overcoming trauma. Doing this work required Dana to study ancient Greek. Now, this is where I come in, which he did with extraordinary dedication. Those are Bonnie's words, but they're also mine, uh, in order to challenge standard translations of Greek texts and propose uh, alternative readings. And I remember many a happy hour spent at Roma's Cafe in the summer reading symposium uh, with Dana. Uh, she then turns to the works of Simon de Beauvoir and offers an interpretation from a Kierkegaardian perspective which allows her to distinguish key structures of temporality operative in trauma and the denial of trauma, and to claim that in order to overcome trauma, we have first to remember it. It requires an enormous courage, both personal and institutional courage, to confront draw trauma in a way that breaks the cycle of violence and denial that characterizes a trauma culture. The same call, uh, courage that, on Dana's reading, Plato himself called for in the ancient academy in the wake of the history of the traumatic Peloponnesian War. And Dana's dissertation exemplifies this same courage, just as her personal life does. Since she became part of what um, became our part of the philosophy department and joined the larger UO community, Dana has been part of what the Atlantic magazine calls a national a renaissance of student activism. She has helped found and lead a student movement to address the enormous increases in tuition that leaves so many of our students in massive debt when they graduate from college. She was a key player in the graduate student strike on campus that resulted in real material gains from her MA and PhD students. And she has, yes indeed, uh, and she has been. And she has been a voice of conscience for the University of Oregon in its efforts to address and sometimes avoid and deny the issue of sexual and of violence on campus. All of that and a number of other challenges, including two hospitalization-worthy bike crashes. Dana, you've got to watch out for those cars. Uh, has made, <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, has made the road to completing the PhD uh, an arduous one as well, you can imagine. I think that we could even say that there have been moments of real trauma on the road to the PhD. I think that we can safely say that persisting required courage, and I know this from my own experience, uh, real courage in the very mode that Dana unearths in Plato's works. So, Dana, what I uh, want for you most of all today is that you savor every moment, every detail of this accomplishment, that you recognize the courageous woman that you are and that you continue to become, 
and that you remember in order to forget and in order to lose yourself in what comes next. I wish you no more or less than your own continued courage, Dr. Romney, as the next chapter, or should we say the next epic journey, begins. Okay, our next uh, doctoral candidate is Joshua August or Gus uh, Scorbert. And uh, Mark Johnson will uh, now present his. Uh, I've been uh, teaching for over 40 years, and working with Gus has been uh, one of the greatest pleasures of, the, of my teaching career. More than any other graduate student I've ever advised, Gus best embodies the commitment to philosophical pluralism, which I take to be the view that we, in order to get any sufficiently complex and rich understanding of any topic, from human nature to morality to virtue, um, we need to employ multiple perspectives from multiple disciplines. And doing this is really hard. It's hard not to sound foolish when you jump out into these other fields. Um, from the moment Gus arrived, I was impressed because on his own initiative, he began to make connections with the psychology department. It's one thing to read some neuroscience. Um, but it's quite another to actually take the science courses, which Gus did, go over there, start taking the courses, and learn about the relevant methods of research. This led Gus to, to um, Gus's being invited to participate on research projects, and I found this incredibly impressive because these projects presupposed a very high level of methodological sophistication. You had to understand how they did things in the psych department in an experimental method, and you had to know something about neuroimaging and brain research. It takes intelligence, courage, dedication, and a strong worth ethic to do this type of thing especially when it falls outside the comfortable confines of the philosophy you're used to doing. And that's Gus. He goes out there and goes for it. During all of this science immersion, however, Gus never wavered in his steadfast commitment to a broad pluralistic view that does, that does what? It brings together multiple scientific fields from cognitive neuroscience to developmental psychology to moral psychology, to social psychology, all of those scientific approaches, it blends in with and puts in dialogue with analytic moral theory, phenomenology, pragmatist philosophy, and feminist theory. And yes, he can do all of that. It's not, it, this is a real fact, not a pseudo fact. There are not many people in the world who can work across all of these different fields. Bringing all of these orientations together, he wrote a terrific doctoral dissertation, a real pleasure, that started from the idea of externalized mind, which is the hypothesis that mind is not some internal, mental, subjective entity somewhere, or reality, locked up within the boundaries, as he likes to say, of skin and skull. But instead, mind extends out into the environments we live in and through. It incorporates our social relations, material objects, informational technologies. So the mind is in the world in a very real way. So we then ask the following question. What becomes of our notions of virtue, human virtue, moral virtue? Once we see that our mind and our personal identity stretches out into the world beyond our bodies, Gus argued that we can't just conceive of virtue as a disposition locked up within the mind, but must see it as encompassing aspects of our surroundings, stretching out into the environment. This means that we have to reconsider, which he did in his dissertation, 
our, our sense of responsibility for who we are and for others and for how we cultivate moral virtue. His dissertation was a beautiful example of a pluralistic approach that's both existentially meaningful, deals with a real topic that matters for human life, and is ethically engaged. It reveals his commitment to a philosophy that makes a difference for how we ought to live. So, to conclude, it's no surprise that, and I wasn't surprised, but I was thrilled when Gus won a prestigious postdoctoral fellowship at Duke with affiliations in the Department of Philosophy, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and the Social Sciences Research Institute. He's working with some of the best people in his field of interest in a way that manifests his conception of what philosophy can and ought to do to help us live better lives. It's a real pleasure to hood Gus and to witness his transformation into the next stage of his career. And I would end by saying, um, for some reason, they had him fill out the thing the undergraduates fill out. I just wanted to read you two things. Um, and it says, so it said, why, did I, why did I choose to major in philosophy? And Gus said, when I was an undergraduate, I was impressed that philo philosophy graduate students could have a two martini lunch talking about big ideas and consider it work. <laughs> I don't think that's what we do, but anyway, uh, maybe a microbrew or something like that. And finally, let me, let me just read what he said, other things you'd like to mention. I'm incredibly grateful for the unconditional support from my parents, John and Mary Ann Scorberg, and my partner, Kristen Reinhardt. I'm also grateful for the personal and professional mentorship provided by Professor Mark Johnson, Professor Nikolai Moriar, and Professor Colin Copeland. Okay, now for the master's candidates. So this year we have uh, two students receiving their MAs in philosophy who are also continuing in our uh, philosophy program as PhD students. Um, these are uh, Joshua David Kerr, who uh, was up here earlier on the stage for winning the uh, Graduate Philosophy Matters Prize, and um, Jane uh, Nam. We also have two students receiving a terminal a master's degree in philosophy, both of whom are moving on to study philosophy uh, at other institutions and entering uh, programs uh, at the doctoral level. Amy Nye, is she here today? Amy Nye defended her master's thesis in the spring of 2018, the title of which was Genealogy Through the Decolonial Turn cultivating critical attitudes, and Amy will be entering the philosophy PhD program at the University of Memphis this fall. Daniel Michael Westbrook completed his uh, master's degree in 2018, and he will be attending the PhD program in philosophy at Emory University in the fall. Okay, so uh, next is uh, Aaron McKenna, who will introduce the uh, baccalaureate candidates. So it is my honor to present our um, graduating majors and minors, and I know this is the moment many of you have been waiting, been waiting for all day. I also want to make sure that you know that there is a little reception afterward, and the faculty really look forward to meeting you um, and all of your families at that time. So hopefully we will see you there. So without further ado, John Carlo Alfano. <laughs> John Carlo writes that he chose the philosophy major. I'm going to just move this a little bit. He chose philosophy because I enjoy learning about the way in which people think about the world and their existence in it. Favorite philosopher, Alan Watts. 
because he accurately discusses Eastern thought through Western ideas and concepts which reveals more about our relationship with ourselves and nature. Next year's plans include attending law school for environmental and contract law. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank my family and friends for being here. Um, also the wonderful faculty and staff for I could not have done this without you. And for everyone else here today, for if it weren't for you, it would just be us. So thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth Reyes Beltran. <laughs> Elizabeth writes, I was originally an ethics minor, but when I completed the requirements for it, I found that philosophy was something I really loved and wanted to pursue further. Favorite philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Because after stepping away from religion, I found myself struggling with the idea that life has no purpose or meaning. However, through him, I learned how this, actu is, um, how this actually is an affirmation of life because it means that we can not only do whatever we want, but also give life our own meaning. And to me, there is nothing more beautiful and liberating than that. Plans for next year include moving to Washington, D.C. and working for Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley to advance social and economic justice issues. Um, I just want to thank my family for their ongoing support. Uh, when I told them I was majoring in philosophy, they're like, what is that? <laughs> um, but I promise I have a plan. And I just want to thank the uh, faculty here. I felt consistently supported. Um, yeah, it's been a great four years. Thank you. I should mention that Elizabeth served on our diversity committee as an undergraduate representative as well. <laughs> Next, Justin Burry. <laughs> Justin chose philosophy, he says, because I knew that I loved to read and write and I was exposed to some political philosophy my senior year of high school that made me interested in the discipline. I also wanted my undergraduate studies to prepare me for law school and felt that deconstructing arguments and comprehending their underlying logic would be extremely useful. Favorite philosopher, Val Plumwood. <laughs> I have never heard of another philosopher who had a dialogical relationship with a wombat, or any other non-human animal for that matter, and survived an attack by a crocodile, which made them reconsider death and human embeddedness within nature. Next year's plans include moving to Portland, taking the LSAT, applying to law schools, and hopefully beginning an internship with a civil rights criminal justice organization. Uh, thank you, guys. I just want to give one shout out to my mom. She helped me throughout college, articulating everything, making sure everything worked. Um, also, I chose philosophy as a major. I hadn't taken a single class, so it was like one of the best uninformed decisions of my life. <laughs> Next, Olivia Chandler. <laughs> Olivia chose philosophy because it challenged me intellectually, she says, and was truly interesting. Favorite philosopher, Val Plumwood. They just finished the class, so it's really not fair. <laughs> Val Plumwood, most influencing instructors, Dr. Aaron McKenna and Dr. David Baumeister, who you heard about earlier. Of their love for and interest in animals, as well as, um, she chose philosophy because um, of their love and interest in animals, as well as making me feel I had a place within the field of philosophy. Plans for next year include venturing to the East Coast, where I will hopefully be working for an Olympic level horseback riding trainer, traveling with them and learning from them. Other things you'd like to mention, I could not have gotten to this point today without the love and support of my family. I'm incredibly grateful for that. I also just want to say thank you so much to my family and my friends and all the people who have supported me throughout the years. It has been a, a tough four years, um, but I'm really proud of myself and I couldn't have done any of it without the support and love of my family and friends. So thank you so much and really the faculty has made this, the entire philosophy experience phenomenal for me. So I really thank all of you guys for that as well. Leia Darlene Cruz. <laughs> Leia 
Leia writes that she chose philosophy um, because all of my schooling and military training beforehand had just been teaching me stuff, but didn't teach me how to think about that stuff. I love the humbling feeling of leaving a philosophy lecture completely stunned and stupefied from thinking in a new way. Favorite philosopher, Marcus Aurelius. Because of the stoicism in his meditations helped me to keep my sanity while studying and writing philosophy papers, especially while reading Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. <laughs> he wrote, today I escaped all difficulty, or rather I have cast out all difficulty, for difficulty is not external but rooted in my judgments. Plans for next year? Relax. <laughs> I don't have any grandiose plans for next year and am completely content with that. I've been planning this degree since 2009, so it's time for a recess and to catch up with friends and family. My long-term plan, however, is to pursue my passion of writing and teaching. I should also like to mention that she's an Air Force veteran and I'm a first-generation student graduating with full scholarship from the GI Bill. So I just want to take a second to acknowledge the wealth of wisdom that is on this stage right now, and I'm completely humbled to be sharing this stage with y'all. Um, through the last three years, it's been <clears throat> pretty challenging transitioning from the military to liberal arts college. It's a very different culture. And philosophy, I didn't even start out as a philosophy major. It chose me. Um, and now I'm ready to go into the world as a leader and really think about these critical issues that are facing our country and the nation. So, yeah, finally did it. Rock on. <laughs> Next, we have Carol and Chris. <laughs> Carolyn writes that she chose philosophy because I wanted to expand my scope of knowledge. I came from a conservative background and I wanted to challenge concepts that have been normalized my entire life. I wanted to study decolonial feminist philosophy. Favorite philosopher, Angela Davis, because her dedication to smashing the patriarchy and building constructive forms of resistance that builds the people's power. Plans for next year include building bike lanes and helping people. Um, she wants to study city planning, and, or does study city planning, and believes that cycling can also help with issues of equity. Um, I just want to thank my family for all their support and love, and I want to thank um, all the awesome faculty that have been there for their support as well. Really appreciate it. Amanda, Patricia, Narcisa, De Grazia. <laughs> Amanda writes that she chose philosophy because she enjoys thinking about things in depth, how people think, and why the world has been shaped the way it is. Philosophy discusses those big questions I've always wondered, like why am, why am I here? Why are we all here? What is language? What happens when you die? Favorite philosopher, Bal Plumwood. Just racking them up. But not only are Plumwood's reasonings behind ecological devastation true, but the way she approaches philosophy in general is truly inspiring. As a female, I often feel silenced in the philosophical community, quieted by louder, more eloquent, and articulate voices that love buzzwords. Plumwood writes in such a way, particularly in her book, Eye of the Crocodile, that is so accessible anyone could read it and understand it. Philosophy can be scary to so many people because of its natural tendency to be dense and complicated. My goal as a philosophy major is to remind everyone that philosophy is done every day by everyone. Whether it's wondering what happens after you die or why a particular painting is so beautiful to you, we are constantly asking philosophical questions and this should inspire us to learn more. Val Plumwood is a shining example of this. Plans for next year include travel, returning to graduate school for a degree in counseling. She also majored in sociology and the pairing of that with philosophy has taught her a lot about life and herself and she is incredibly grateful for the department and the wonderful teachers she's had. I just want to say that I didn't do this alone. Um, I want to thank my friends and my family for supporting me, especially my mom. And then a shout out to Erin for being a fabulous teacher. She was my last philosophy teacher, and Paul specifically. Um, he, I took his class twice teaching kids philosophy, and it's what helped me decide that I wanted to major in philosophy. And I hope that he gets to continue it for as long as he wishes to. <laughs> thank you. Layla Ursan. <laughs> Layla
that chose philosophy, she says, because I fell in love with philosophy during a hard time in my life when I was going through the emotions of a sexual assault. Feminist philosophy really picked me up on my feet and helped me to see where I could take my experience to help other women in the same position. <laughs> with philosophy, I've not only been able to contemplate and study other people, but myself as well. Favorite philosopher, John Dewey. Because I believe education is the key to solving some of the biggest issues and concerns in the world, and I agree with the way in which John Dewey thinks education should be taught. Because of his work, I decided to join the Teaching Children Philosophy classes for two terms, and it was truly eye-opening. To have actual open conversation and a true dramatic rehearsal on current issues in the world was something that I believe changed my point of view as well as many children's. Plans for next year include working with victims of sexual assault so I can learn more about the key issues that we as survivors, allies, and for anyone can focus on. After this, I would like to take my knowledge into the school system and possibly continue with my education. She's waiting to find the right major. If um, waiting to find the right major for you is worth that time, I went from not knowing what I was doing in school to using school as my crutch and my passion. Thank you. First off, I did not know that we were going to be reading the survey. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but thank you to my family and friends, and thank you so much to all of the professors that I have had. You have all played a hand in bringing me to the next professor, and you all have been amazing. Thank you. Alexis Gondera. Alexis chose philosophy, she says, because I want to critically engage in philosophical inquiry and strongly believe in Socrates when he says an unexamined life is not worth living. Philosophy was the perfect outlet for me to question anything and everything while developing my reasoning and argumentation skills. Favorite philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche has a way of really making you reevaluate your morals and values. As soon as you think you can stand straight, he pulls the carpet right out from under your feet. He helped me critically evaluate my life and become a stronger person in college. Plans for next year include traveling and searching for a career I'm passionate about where I can use the skills acquired throughout my time in Oregon. She was a double major in philosophy and political science with a minor in business administration um, and Wayne Moore Scholar at the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics. Thank you so much, Mom and Dad. I couldn't have done this without you guys. Thank you so much, my family traveling all the way from Texas to be here today with me. I'm so excited for the weekend. Thank you to these wonderful professors. Um, and thank you for all the teachers that are also in the crowd that played a part in my education here. Thank you. Laura Tasha Ami Garcia. Laura chose philosophy because I enjoyed how philosophy challenges me to think in many different angles and encourages me to analyze any situation from many perspectives before developing my take on the subject at hand. Favorite philosopher, Mary Wollstonecraft. In her work, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, Wollstonecraft brought her idea that women should be given the same educational access as men. It was an extremely revolutionary and controversial subject at the time, but I admire how she didn't care what others would think of her thoughts. Mary Wollstonecraft is also the mother of Mary Shelley, who wrote one of my favorite novels, Frankenstein. Plans for next year include to take a year to, um, to study for both the GRE as well as the LSAT so I could apply to graduate school and law school. I'm not sure which path I want to take, but I hope to be re-enrolled in university by fall 2019. Other things, on my father's side, I'm the first person to graduate from a university. On my mother's side, I'm the first female to do the same. I'm also an only child. <laughs> I'm also an only child and would love to thank my parents for all the love, support, and sacrifices that they have made so I can be walking across this stage. Is there anything you want to add? Like, as I like to repeat, I'd like to thank my parents again. They've been there, like, since, you know, elementary school. So I get, yeah, you're going to go to college. You get that degree. Um, I'd also like to thank my family who drove up from California. Thank you for all being here as well as my Oregon family. Love you guys. I'd also like to thank my friends. Yep, I noticed you guys, woo! <laughs> and as well as the whole faculty up on here, as well as the other professors that uh, couldn't attend. And I'm just, oh, this has been an amazing experience and I wouldn't trade it 
for anything else. And thank you for all of you for attending. Gabby Gardner. Gabby writes that philosophy um, was a major um, to, to pursue. The close critical reading process drew me in, and the dialogue that forms between peers and professors was an invigorating climate that kept me in. It also felt important for me to come from an ethnic studies focus to understand Western thinkers in order to understand, compare, and critique them based on indigenous ways of knowing. Favorite philosopher, Maria Lugones. Lugones has an important understanding of decolonial feminism that has been both empowering and expansive to my world views. Next year, I plan on taking a year to focus on GRE and LSAT prep before applying to dual graduate programs with an emphasis on philosophy and law. Um, thank you for all of my family and chosen family who came here today, and also the ones who couldn't, because as a working class student, I understand that people have work schedules and stuff, so there's a lot of people that aren't here that definitely supported me in my journey. And thank you all for um, making me move past the motto, C's get degrees, <laughs> and actually helping me find my passion and continuing academic pursuits. So thank you all. Jacob Goldfarb. Jacob chose philosophy because I wanted to strengthen my reading skill, my reading comprehension and writing skills. Favorite philosopher, John Dewey. Because Human Nature and Conduct, which is one of Dewey's books, made me more conscious of my own habits and how I maintain and alter them in daily activity. Plans for next year include applying to law school while using my last year of eligibility to play baseball for the Ducks. I'd just like to thank my parents for uh, instilling a strong moral compass in me and for my girlfriend and my parents as well and, and this wonderful faculty for continuously challenging me to use that moral compass and examine my everyday choices. Thank you. Stephanie Gordon. Stephanie chose philosophy because I had inspiring mentors in my philosophy classes. The passion at the UO and the philosophy program for critical thinking, learning, and teaching was everything I'd been searching for in a department. I met some of my best friends in these classrooms and found myself in the text. Favorite philosopher, Simone de Beauvoir, because her words are the words I knew I needed but did not know. Plans for next year include saving money in the hopes of getting my master's and PhD. I'm a first-generation college student. When I graduate, I do so not only for myself, but for my parents, my grandparents, and all those in my life who carried me to this day. My name is Stephanie. Um, I grew up poor. Uh, I grew up, I spent my early life in a trailer. Um, I grew up poor, but my mother made sure that I was never wanting for one thing, books. Uh, recently, when cleaning out our storage unit together, my mom and I found boxes and boxes of books from my childhood. She must have spent every spare dollar she had on making sure I was educated. My family are not academics, but when I was a little girl, my mom told me I would go to college someday. I didn't realize at the time that she had no idea how I would get there. It was a lot of work on both of our behalves, but we got there. Today, because of my mother, I am the first one in my family to stand at this podium, and she stands here with me. She has carried me for so long, and now I carry her across this floor with me. Thank you, Mom. Alec Holm. Alec chose philosophy because it was the first subject that I not only found interesting but also beneficial. Favorite philosopher, Enrique Dussel. He made, makes important efforts to expose the reasoning why Latin America is still underdeveloped, 
uh, today, while also providing a course of action to improve the lives of those who have an, have an unsatisfactory living standards. Next year's plans include traveling to South America and improving Spanish, also a minor in business administration and Spanish. Is there anything? All right, so if you couldn't tell, I did not work very hard on my graduation comments, so I'll attempt to make up for that. I'd really like to thank my family for being so supportive, especially for not getting a business major. And I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank our amazing staff, every one of the teachers that I've both met and had classes with have influenced me much and changed the way I look at the world. I'd like to thank all of you philosophy students as well for doing the exact same thing. You guys are amazing. Thank you. William James Mayer. <laughs> Chose philosophy because I have a love for wisdom. Favorite philosopher, John Paul Sartre because of his assessment of human existence. Plans for next year include working for AmeriCorps in Delaware where I will help tutor and teach third graders. Excellent. There. I'd like to thank everyone for being here uh, and for helping cultivate a rich environment for learning and for education. And rest in peace, Pugsley. Thank you. Caden Malden. In answer to the question of why she chose philosophy, I didn't choose it, it chose me. My favorite philosopher, my little brother and sister. Be <laughs> because children are the best philosophers because their imagination is limitless. Next year's plans are a surprise. She would like to thank family and to all the wonderful professors and graduate employees who supported her. But would you like to add some? I just feel so lucky and fortunate to have had this wonderful opportunity to work with these amazing people and to make all these beautiful friends. And yeah, kids never stop asking questions. Your minds are amazing. Nick McClure. Nick chose philosophy because he was learning the most from his philosophy classes. Favorite philosopher, Mark Johnson. <laughs> Plans for next year, working in Portland. So do you want to expand on any of that? <laughs> All right, I was a little brief as well. I especially want to thank uh, Stephen and Mark for advising my thesis. Um, I also want to thank uh, the fantastic graduate students, especially Anna, Martina, and Larry. Uh, thank you all so much. Kylie McConnell. <laughs> Kylie chose philosophy because I wanted to challenge myself and deepen my knowledge of logic and critical reasoning. Favorite philosophers, Maria Lagones and Val Plumwood because they have both taught me the importance of self-critical reasoning that can resist the unnecessary dualisms that dominate society. Specifically, Lagonis has taught me to recognize multiplicity rather than fragmentation, and Plumwood has taught me the importance of prudential arguments that can be used to argue against irrational forms of rationality. Plans for next year um, include taking a year off from schooling to rethink my life and career goals. Thank you to everyone that has helped me get, to this, uh, get where I am today, specifically to my parents, as well as my most influential professors, Bonnie Mann and Aaron McKenna. I just want to say thank you to my parents again, thank you to all my family and my boyfriend for supporting me and dealing with all my mental breakdowns. <laughs> um, thank you to all the faculty and yeah, thank you. Sorry for the bad timing. Nick's already walked across the stage, but I wanted to say a couple of words as his uh, uh, thesis advisor about his thesis. It was remarkable, and I, I think I'd rather put him through the ringer for the past year, so he deserves a few extra words, I think. Um, he came to me about a year ago with the idea of writing. Uh, he's, uh, Nick was a uh, major in philosophy and a minor in creative writing and a member of the very prestigious uh, kid uh, creative writing program here at the university. And he came with, to me with this idea, I want to write some fiction that does philosophical work. And I thought, okay, that's a great idea, sure. 
Um, but you'll have to do more than that. You'll have to write the, the, do the fiction, and then you'll have to meditate it on, on it as a philosopher and explain it to the rest of us where the philosophical work is. He not only, so he did both of those things. He not only did that, but in the process of this, I sent him to Mark Johnson to, uh, uh, to, as, a, uh, as a second reader and to get a few ideas of what more he might do. Mark uh, recommended to him a book uh, by uh, John Gardner on moral fiction, which then uh, uh, Nick worked through uh, Gardner's distinction between moral fiction and moralistic fiction. Uh, and then gave an account not only of, of the imminent philosophical uh, content of his story, but then discussed it at the meta level, engaging then, and, and this took some courage, I think, and I, I don't know how much courage he quite uh, knew he was uh, embracing at this point. I then sent him to read some of Mark Johnson's work, uh, perhaps why he's his favorite philosopher, uh, one of mine too, uh, and then brought uh, uh, into uh, a conversation with, with Gardner's idea of moral fiction, brought this into account of, uh, with uh, Professor Johnson's uh, account of moral deliberation as informed by John Dewey and a lot of contemporary uh, cognitive science. Uh, so he did a, a, a wide sweeping thing working at all different levels and it, it came out terrifically and I'm extremely proud of him. So anyway, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. And congrats to all the graduates. Matt McCrew. Matt chose philosophy because I really enjoy reading philosophy. Pursuing proper methods for answering life's questions is a noble activity. Favorite philosopher, John Dewey, because he understands the social nature of human interaction and applies it to his ethics in a way that feels uniquely applicable. Plans for next year, work for a law office or nonprofit and save up for law school. Uh, thank you, mom and dad, and congratulations on getting your third and last kid through college. <laughs> Cassie Mullins. <laughs> Cassie chose philosophy because I enjoyed discussions of meaning and intent. Favorite philosopher, Karl Marx, because he had an amazing beard and taught me an economic system that could value people over capital. Plans for next year to go to school to obtain my paralegal certificate and then work as a paralegal. She writes, the UO was a great place to cultivate an attitude of critical thinking and an openness to discussion. Uh, I just want to thank my parents for supporting me and encouraging me to follow my passions. And I want to thank all my friends for supporting me when I felt like I couldn't support myself. So thank you. Jonathan Wodgoski. Jonathan chose philosophy because philosophy provides individuals with the tools necessary to critically analyze situations and have logical conversations. It is so much more than just an educational tool. It's a way of seeing the ways in which the world's pieces collide and collaborate. Favorite philosophers, Deleuze and Guattari. I really identify with their notion of rhizomes. I hope to take my talents into the cannabis industry where I will focus on ethical analysis and building relationships to understand the complexity that comes with legalization. I would like to thank my parents, sister, and family for supporting me throughout my academic career. I couldn't have done it without them. <laughs> I just want to say thanks to my family um, and friends and my parents for allowing me to switch majors about 10 times uh, in two different universities. Um, and the staff here, specifically uh, Professor Broden, because um, your Children's of Philosophy class really changed my life. Um, and I think it inspires everybody to really be a better person and really encourage children to have open, free thought. So that's about it. And we did it. <laughs> Just done? Okay. That completes.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 